Well, good evening to all of you. I'm Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government here at the University of Oxford. A very warm welcome to all of you who have made it here in person through the freezing cold and a very warm welcome also to all of those of you who are joining us online for this evening's lecture. The Alfred Landecker Memorial Lecture is something, is an event that we host every year at the school on the United Nations Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, the Alfred Landecker Memorial Lecture is named in honor of Alfred Landecker and the Alfred Landecker Foundation. And it's a real pleasure tonight to have here the chair of the Alfred Landecker Foundation, Dan Dina, who you'll hear from uh, in a moment, and the co-CEOs of the Alfred Landecker Foundation, uh, Lena Altman and Silkemer, who are here um, in, in the audience. The foundation was built to build a better world than the world in which Alfred Landecker himself, a Jew who died during the Holocaust, lived. The foundation in his memory seeks to ensure that all people have the right to live without fear, persecution and suffering. The, the foundation is working with all of its might to promote societies which are free of discrimination. And in this lecture each year, we like to look back to remember the Holocaust, remember what we as this generation need, not just to remember, but to begin to do in order to ensure that we and our children and their grandchildren live in societies which are free from discrimination. This is the fourth Alfred Landecker Foundation lecture. The first was given by Professor Joe Wolfe, who's going to chair this evening's lecture and the discussion among panelists which will follow. The second was given by Dan Dina, who's also with us this evening and is chair of the foundation. And the third was given by Norbert Fry, who is um, on the academic council of the foundation. So thank you all for joining us this evening. And if you can join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Joe Wolfe, the Alfred Landecker Professor of Public Policy and Values here at the Blavatnik School. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much, Nairi, and uh, welcome to everyone. It's really such a pleasure to be introducing this lecture in person in this lecture theater. Uh, the first was in person. Uh, the last two have been online. Uh, you know, very significant, very important lectures and discussions. But um, there's something special about holding it in person and being in this, we hope, post-pandemic era uh, when we can have events like this. But what we've learned is also the value of the, the live stream and being able to make an event like this available to people all around the world, which I understand is happening. So we're really delighted to be able to do that. Uh, the order of events for today, uh, we'll, we'll have the lecture. I'll introduce our lecturer just in a second. Uh, after the lecture, we'll have a panel discussion, three presenters who I will introduce uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, we'll have a short presentation from each of the three panelists and then a response. Uh, we won't be taking questions in the lecture theater, but the lecturer and the panelists and anyone who wants to join us is invited to drink outside and um, questions can follow in an informal way uh, over a drink rather than in the lecture theater. So um, that brings me to introduce our fourth Alfred Landeker Memorial Lecturer, uh, Professor Leora Bilski. Leora Bilski is full professor at the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law and director of the Minerva Center for Human Rights at Tel Aviv. She studied at the Hebrew University and Yale Law School, and she's been visiting professor at Toronto University and Amherst College, and as a fellow in the Ethics and Professions Program at Harvard University. 
She served as editor-in-chief of the political theory journal, Theory and Criticism, and as editor of several law journals. Uh, she's the author of two very significant books, the editor of many collections, the author of many, many papers and chapters on similar topics, but her books are Transformative Justice, Israel Identity on Trial, which was Michigan University Press in 2004, and more recently, The Holocaust, Corporations and the Law, 2007, also Michigan University Press. So, Leora, uh, welcome to the school and lecture. I'm much looking forward to your lecture today. Thank you, Professor Wolf, uh, and thank you for the Albert, Alfred Lange Decker Memorial uh, Lecture uh, Foundation. And thank you for the panelists that are going to follow. Since the 1990s, international criminal law has struggled to find the proper role for victims in mass atrocities trials. It has gradually moved from viewing victims instrumentally as, su as supplying eyewitness with testimonies for the prosecution towards recognizing the agency of victims and seeing them as active participants in such trials. In today's memorial lecture, I would like to return to the forgotten contribution of Rachel Oyerbach, a Jewish Polish journalist, historian, and Holocaust survivor and explore her important contribution to the Eichmann trial, where she helped shape a new paradigm of a victim-centered atrocity trial. Oyerbach's vision for the trial, as I shall present in my talk today, can be understood as an early precursor of later developments in both international criminal law and more broadly in the field of transitional justice. Oyerbach developed her ideas on victims' testimonies as part of a group of Jewish activists in the Warsaw Ghetto who, under the leadership of historian Immanuel Ringelblum, created a clandestine archive known as the Oineg Shabbos Archive. These ideas derived from an Eastern European tradition of destruction historiography as well as the new practices of oral history developed in the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in the 1920s. After the war, Oyerbach, who was one of the three survivors of the archives group, became a central figure in preserving and continuing the legacy. She lobbied to search for the lost archive that was buried under the debris of Warsaw efforts that led to the eventual discovery of two thirds of the original archive. She joined other survivor historians in translating these ideas into a new praxis of victims' testimonies. First, in the Central Jewish Historical Commission in Poland, which collected survivors' diaries, memoirs, and victims' testimonies, and published several important books of the documentation and testimonies, and later, following her immigration to Israel as the director of the Testimony Collection Department of Yad Vashem. In June 1960, in anticipation of the Eichmann trial, Oyerbach gave her first public lecture in Hebrew, in which she presented her novel conception of a victim-centered Holocaust trial. She went on to advise Attorney General Gidon Hausner and the Israeli prosecution, who adopted some of her ideas in the trial. Oyerbach herself was invited to give testimony in the trial as well, but her contribution and legacy have largely been forgotten in Israeli collective memory and did not receive recognition in the annals of international law. In my talk, I attempt to recover Oyerbach's early efforts to reimagine the role of the victim in Holocaust trials by putting forward a new conception of victim's testimony for the Eichmann trial. But before turning to the particular case of Oyerbach, it is important to consider the general phenomenon of the erasure and marginalization of the contribution of women to international law. 
One obstacle for recognizing women's contrib contribution to international law is connected to the demarcation of disciplinary boundaries and notions of expertise. In the last decade, there have been a historian turn in international law with a growing body of research on the distinctive role of Jewish emigrant lawyers in its development. Women's contribution to the field, however, is largely absent from this new wave of scholarship. One explanation is that women were often amateur activists, neither professional lawyers nor professional historians. Oyerbach is a good example of this. Although she studied history and psychology at the university, she did not become a professional historian or a psychologist, but rather pursued the career of a journalist, writer, and archivist. Notwithstanding her important contribution to Holocaust historiography, she did not become a university professor and therefore did not have graduate students who could continue her legacy. Her works were published in Polish, Yiddish, and Hebrew, but very few were translated into English. Another obstacle stems from the fact that even when women make important contribution to the field of international law, their role is often marginalized and or appropriated by men. This is certainly true of Oyerbach's vision and involvement in the Eichmann trial. The marginalization of Oyerbach is vividly demonstrated by the video clips of the Warsaw Ghetto testimony from the Eichmann trial that appear on YouTube. Four different witnesses appeared in two separate sessions dedicated to the Warsaw Ghetto. Tivia Lubetkin and Yitzhak Zuckerman, among the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, were the first to testify and Oyerbach and Adolf Berman were scheduled to testify after the lunch break. Oyerbach testified about the cultural and intellectual life in the ghetto and about its destruction, while Berman's testimony dealt with the murder of the ghetto's children and attempts to save them. However, of these four testimonies, only that of Oyerbach is missing on YouTube. In his book on the trial, Attorney General Gidon Hausner takes credit for the revolution in the part played by victims in the Eichmann trial to himself. He dedicates only a few sentences to Oyerbach and her role in the Warsaw Ghetto. While acknowledging Oyerbach for providing the prosecution with various testimonies of survivors from the collection of her department at Yad Vashem, he paints her contribution to the trial as technical and logistical at best. New historical research has tried to do her um, retrospective justice, arguing that it was her initiative to open the trial to the testimonies of Holocaust survivors. Indeed, already in the first document Oyerbach prepared for the trial, dated November 3rd, 1960, she requested to rely on living witnesses and Jewish sources. She feared that the trial will be conducted as an ordinary criminal trial based on incriminating German documents and eyewitnesses who saw Eichmann face to face and could directly inculpate him. In contrast, Oyerbach wanted to include survivor witnesses who were in the middle of the horrors of the extermination and who survived nonetheless to tell the story. Historian Sharon Geva offers another explanation from Oerbach marginalization that relates to the content of her testimony, which lacked any personal stories of suffering and was focused on cultural activities in the ghetto. She writes, it seems that she had no chance given the scant familiarity of the Israeli public with the realities of Jewish life in Poland during the Holocaust, her testimony did not raise any interest, let alone convince the public that these cultural activities should be considered resistance. Her testimony harmed the, pros the prosecution as it gave the impression that life was not so bad in Warsaw. Geva maintains that Oyerbach had unrealistic expectations of the trial. 
she failed to understand the difference between law and history, between the strict procedures of a criminal trial and a public lecture. I would like to offer a different explanation. The problem, I believe, was not Oerbach's failure to understand the limits of law, but rather her attempt to revolutionize law in a manner that clashed in important ways with the approach adopted by the prosecution. Even though both Hausner and Oerbach shared a conception of the Eichmann trial based on survivors' testimonies, their views of those testimonies and the role they should play in the trial differed. In the following, I will elaborate on Oerbach's conception of victims' testimonies and trace its origins to the practice of Oineg Shabbes archive. Note its difference from ordinary uh, eyewitness testimonies and show how Oerbach sought to adapt, to adapt it to the trial. I will then turn briefly to Oerbach's own testimony in the trial and explain the connection she sought to promote between the crime of cultural genocide and the act of giving testimony. I will conclude by explaining why Oerbach's novel conception of victims' testimonies is still missing in international criminal trials, notwithstanding the evolution in the role of the victims. On 24 uh, June 1960, about a month after Eichmann was uh, captured, Oerbach delivered her first public lecture in Hebrew in the Eliyahu Club in Haifa. She began with an apology. This is my first lecture in Hebrew. I will ask for help here and there with a word or to fix an error. If I don't succeed, I'll turn to Yiddish. In her lecture, Oerbach tries to familiarize her Israeli audience with the work of the testimony collection department that she directed at Yad Vashem. In order to explain her conception of victim's testimony and how it could be brought to bear on the structure of the Eichmann trial. I will reconstruct her ideas from a handwritten document found in her archive that contains an outline of the lecture and from her other writing and we'll discuss five themes about the role of the victims in atrocity trials that she tried to promote. So the first theme. Oerbach wrote in her lecture notes, testimony as a central Jewish source, as opposed to archival material from German sources, therein lies its historiographical importance. Contrary to the document-centered approach prevailing in the International Military Tribunal uh, in Nuremberg, which was wary of the testimony of Jewish victims because of their potential biases and psychological injuries, Oerbach believed that the Eichmann trial should not be limited to German archival sources. However, as a stateless persecuted group, the Jewish victims did not have their own official archive. Nevertheless, Oerbach sought Jewish sources, and she believed that victims' testimonies could supply this missing perspective. Specifically, Oerbach saw the opportunity in the Eichmann trial to publicly hear the testimonies of Holocaust survivors that she and other victim historians have been collecting since the early post-war days. She convinced Hausner and the Israeli prosecution that it was essential to open the trial to survivors' testimonies. However, Hausner's reasons for adopting this approach differed significantly from hers. In his memoir of the trial, Hausner wrote, in order to merely secure a conviction, it was obviously enough to let the archives speak. A fraction of them would have sufficed to get Eichmann's sentence 10 times over. But I knew we needed more than a conviction. We needed a living record of a gigantic hum human and national disaster, though it could never be more than a feeble echo of the real events. Oerbach also sought to balance German archival documents with Jewish victims' testimonies, 
referring to survivor testimonies as a living archive. However, unlike Hausner, she did not see the testimonies as merely illustrative, as a way to bring the historical record to life. In her view, survivors' testimonies bore an independent historiographical and legal value since they could reveal what the German documents often concealed, the experience of the crime from the point of view of its victims. And she wrote, but we knew that if there was a factor that could silence these doubts, it would be only the witnesses and not necessarily those who had seen Eichmann face to face, but the witnesses who had been deep inside the horrors of the extermination and had survived in order to tell. This is one of the reasons why she opposed the legalist approach of the Israeli police who evaluated survivors' testimony as potential eyewitnesses according to forensic consideration and wanted to invite about 20 of them. The second aspect. Oyerbach wrote in her notes, creating historical material whose source is the memory of a living human being not just testimonies, but the collection of existing memory material, eliciting and writing down testimony, prom prompting, encouraging, and guiding people to write independently, diaries. This quote from her Eliyahu Club notes reveals her attempt to challenge the common notion that testimonies exist in the world ready-made, just waiting to be collected. Oyerbach emphasized the difficulty by using different verbs to describe the process of collecting them, eliciting, writing down, prompting, encouraging, guiding. Here again, she followed the approach that had begun in Onek Shabbat, where the various methods for eliciting testimonies had been created, such as encouraging ordinary people to write diaries, to join writing contests, and to collect day-to-day -day materials. After the war, the Jewish Historical Commission, to which Oyerbach joined and belonged, developed these methods and wrote several manuals for collecting testimonies. Oyerbach argued that the high quality of the witnesses whom her department and the Yad Vashem recommended to the Eichmann prosecution could be attributed precisely to these meticulous methods of collecting testimonies, as she wrote. Our witnesses were among the best and most prominent witnesses, not only because they were selected on the basis of material that had been collected for years, but especially because our methods of eliciting testimony had trained them to fulfill this task and helped them extract from the depth of their memory the images and experiences that were buried there. In contrast to the legal approach to testimony that views with suspicion any intervention in the witness's testimony, Oyerbach insisted that Holocaust testimonies required the interviewer, often a victim himself, to actively encourage the victim to bear witness given their preference to forget and repress traumatic events. The early practice of collecting testimonies by the victims themselves from other victims diverged from traditional uh, history writing by professional historians after the fact and from legal practice by policemen after the fact. In her testimony during the Eichmann trial, Orbach gives the example of how she wrote down the testimony of Yaakov Kaspitsky, the first Jewish prisoner who had managed to escape from Treblinka back to the Warsaw Ghetto after spending 18 days in the death camp. Oyerbach interviewed him in the ghetto over a period of several weeks and wrote down his testimony in his own words with her commentary in over 323 pages of notebooks. Kaspitsky was subsequently killed in the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. So if she had not insisted on taking his detailed testimony of Treblinka in real time in the ghetto, it would have been lost for history. 
the third aspect. Auerbach regarded testifying as an expression of a collective grassroots movement. True to the legacy of the Ringelblum archive, she rejected the traditional distinction between detached history writing and involved political action. Indeed, the archive was part of a broader initiative in the ghetto of Alain Hilf, self-help, which included a network of soup kitchens, refugee centers, house committees, etc. Unlike philanthropy, which brings help from the outside to passive victims, in the ghetto, the grassroots organization began with the agency of the victims themselves as part of what Auerbach dubbed passive resistance. And she wrote, just as there is no precedence for the Shoah, so there, is, there has never been such a collective, spontaneous and elemental movement, not in our and not in any other nation or language. All our organized activity is but an instrument in the service of this movement. Here lies the secret of our existence. Oilbach herself was recruited by Ringelblum to the archive to write reports about hunger because she, because of her role as the director of a soup kitchen that she ran in the ghetto, which at its peak fed 2,000 Jews a day. According to historian Samuel Kassov, the kitchen offered her a unique vantage point from which to observe and write the social history of hunger in the ghetto by telling the story of the soup kitchen as a microcosm of human relations and human choices. In her Eliao Club uh, lecture, Oerbach depicts the process of collecting testimonies that began in the ghetto as part of a popular movement rather than the domain of expert jurists or historians. She regards collecting testimonies and history writing as part of a grassroots movement of the people and for the people. She stresses the collective aspects of the enterprise and links it to the Yivo tradition of recruiting hundreds of Zamlers, collectors, for its historiograph historiographical project. However, alongside the collective aspect, uh, Oerbach attributes um, importance to the individual voice of the victim. The Eichmann trial, therefore, provided her with the perfect opportunity to translate her approach to victims' testimonies to a legal set setting. In a trial, testimonies are given in the first-person voice. Therefore, Oyerbach promoted the idea of telling the collective history of the Holocaust through the individual testimonies of around 100 survivors. The fourth aspect. Oyerbach was unique in her emphasis on the psychological aspects of giving testimony. She had studied psychology at the University of Lviv and in her journalist career often wrote about psychological factors in the behavior of individuals and groups. This background evidentially influenced her understanding of survivors' uh, testimonies. She did not believe that the therapeutic aspects of testimony conflicted with the criminal trial, but rather saw them as complementary. She wrote, the psychological aspect released from tragic contact, a psychohygienic popular enterprise, protests and tears. Auerbach rejected the prevailing perception of the time that saw forgetting or silence as a way for the Holocaust survivor to recover. On the contrary, she viewed testimony as part of a process of catharsis, released from tragic material, and regarded the trial as playing important role in this process. However, it would be wrong to understand Oerbach's approach in terms of individual therapy, such as takes place in the private clinic of the psychotherapist. In the quote above, she describes the process of recovery or renewal in collective national terms. Obach returns to the original Greek understanding of catharsis as a process of social purification that depends on a public forum. 
and on public speech. Greek tragedy and trials were integral parts of the public sphere. And likewise, Euerbach saw survivor's testimony as part of a collective psychohygienic enterprise. In the margins of the page, she wrote, in this trial too, we have to release ourselves from the destructive content. And she added at the end of her notes, finally, we have to make a productive, constructive rectification by passing on the knowledge of the Holocaust, end of quote. By understanding testimony in therapeutic terms, Euerbach was ahead of her time as the therapeutic approach to victims' testimonies in the law developed only in the late 1990s. When the new model of Truth and Reconciliation Commission was developed during South Africa's transition to democracy. But this transformation was undertaken outside the setting of a criminal trial. The last aspect. Eurbach writes, for us, it is a big thing. It releases us from a sense of loneliness. With this point, Euerbach refers to what she sees as the most important contribution of the trial. Hausner regarded the trial as a means of giving voice back to Holocaust survivors by turning them from passive victims into witnesses for the prosecution. Euerbach, in contrast, did not think that the trial was necessary for this as the victims themselves had already initiated the enterprise of living documentation, of collecting testimonies in the Ringelblum archival project in the ghetto and after the war, in the commissions they created and in Yad Vashem. Therefore, she believed that the significance of the trial lay elsewhere in its ability to release the, the survivors from a sense of loneliness the trial could play an important role, not because it transformed silent victims into witnesses, but because it released them from being confined to the bubble of speaking to themselves. I would like now to turn to Euerbach's own testimony in the Eichmann trial. Euerbach planned to testify on the, on the issue of cultural genocide the deliberate cultural destruction wrought by the Nazis on Jewish Borso as part of their attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. Accordingly, Euerbach did not perceive herself as an ordinary eyewitness in the trial, nor did she understand her own testimony in terms of telling her personal story of pain and suffering. She saw herself as an expert witness about the crime of genocide and the Jewish counter response, the agency of victims in finding ways to resist through the act of giving testimony by creating an archive and documenting their destruction. In fact, she wanted to give a meta uh, testimony about the role of testimony. She wanted to explain the link between the new crime and testimony as spiritual resistance. Unlike ordinary witnesses, Euerbach wrote her own proposal to the prosecution about the subject of her testimony that her testimony should cover and kept in her own archive many drafts of her intended testimony. But all her preparation came to naught. Her testimony paled in comparison to her writing and failed to reflect the points she had prepared. Moreover, her testimony was often interrupted by the prosecutor and the judges who repeatedly asked, asked her to focus on the prosecutor's questions. In a letter she sent to Hausner, immediately after giving her testimony, Euerbach wrote, it pains me in particular and my, and my conscience is not quiet that I did not manage to tell as I had inten intended to, the story of the spiritual annihilation of the intellectuals. And the case of the murder of the intellectuals is of particular significance in the overall balance of biological genocide. I think that Professor Baron touched on this case in his testimony, but did not give concrete data on it. <clears throat> 
the reference to the prominent Jewish historian Salo Baron is significant. Baron, a professor of Jewish history at Columbia University, was invited to the trial as an expert historian and was the first witness for the prosecution. He was called to present the historical narrative of the Holocaust as a whole. But Baron, like Oerbach, chose to emphasize the cultural aspects of the crime of genocide, as well as the Jewish organization's effort to restitute their lost books and libraries as a counter response to it. From her letter, we learn that Oerbach wanted to continue in the same vein in order to sub substantiate Baron's thesis by testifying to the cultural destruction of Jewish Warsaw and to the grassroots response of collecting testimonies. Oerbach planned to testify about the Nazi degrees, about the increasing hunger and disease, about self-help organizations, and about the various endeavors by the Jews to maintain political and cultural life in the ghetto, such as newspapers, school, libraries, and cultural events. In this context, she wanted to present the uniqueness of Ringelblum's leadership and the Oneg Shabbos archival project. However, the message she had wished to impart was not understood. In a confidential letter she sent to Arye Kobovi, then the director of the board of Yad Vashem, Oyerbach expressed the shock that her experience in the trial had caused her. And she wrote, I suddenly felt a contraction of my heart muscle until my only thought at that moment was just to step down, to step down as soon as possible and, on, and only not to faint and not to become a subject of stupid sensation in the press. She blamed the prosecution for its decision to postpone her testimony that was supposed to be the first of the testimonies on the Warsaw Ghetto and to place it after the testimony on the Warsaw Revolt by the heroes of the Warsaw Uprising and before the testimony of Adolf Berman on the fate of the children. To try to relate the history, the, sorry, the story of cultural genocide in between these two extremes proved impossible. Notwithstanding her meticulous preparation and many drafts for the testimony at the trial itself, she testified in broken Hebrew and did not succeed in conveying the unique nature of the activities of the victims in collecting testimonies. I will just give one example to it. When Oerbach began to describe the self-help activities in the ghetto, she was asked where the means for the various organizations had come from. In order to prevent any confusion, Oerbach hastened to explain, I want to say that this is not the same as with the Judenrat, the self-help organization, but she was cut short by the prosecutor who interrupted her. Who said that it was the same? Later, when asked about the Ringelblum archival project, she tried to explain the connection between relief work and history writing by describing her own work in the soup kitchen. She tried to condense the whole novelty of the archive into a brief descri description, but without further elaboration, their activities did not sound like a proper conspiracy, let alone resistance. She failed to convey the radical ideas of the archive group about the connection between relief work, documentation, and testimony as part of a spontaneous grassroots movement of the victims. She failed to explain the innovative approach to testimony that this episode was meant to, do to demonstrate. Instead, running a soup kitchen was heard as the typical philanthropic work of a woman. In conclusion, Hausner saw the central innovation of the Eichmann trial in its ability to give voice to silent victims. He believed that only a sovereign state can restore the agency to the victims by opening the trial to their testimonies. And he emphasized the physical annihilation and physical armed resistance. 
Auerbach shared his understanding of the trial as a symbol of Israel's sovereignty. However, she deeply disagreed about his view of victims as passive recipient of justice from the state. She saw the victims' efforts to collect testimonies already in the ghetto as giving birth to the Eichmann trial. In her testimony in the trial, she claimed, I wanted to say that in my opinion, Dr. Ringelblum was the first to start with the writing of the great indictment, and there is a direct path from that place in the ghetto to this courtroom. Oilbach's testimony failed for many reasons, but with the disappearance of her testimony from the annals of international law, we also lost sight of the important alternative she promoted. International criminal law still struggles with the questions that preoccupied Oyerbach. Can we expand the crime of genocide beyond physical violence and mass murder to encompass cultural genocide? How can we make victims an integral part of atrocities trials without presenting them as passive and helpless? Is erasing the agency of the victim the price that has to be paid for conducting a criminal trial? The role of victims in the trials of mass atrocities and political violence has greatly changed since their early exclusion from the IMT in Nuremberg. The special tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in the 1990s really relied heavily on victims as eyewitnesses for the prosecution. However, they did not become full participants in the trial. As a, as a result, the historical narrative these trials advance is of victims as passive recipients of international justice. This is especially true of female victims whose testimonies are confined to stories of rape and sexual violence. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court adopted a more victim-centered perspective and began to perceive victims whose views and concerns should be given consideration, but it still did not recognize them as full parties to the trial. Oyerbach's vision was more radical, since she believed that the victims should play a proactive role in atrocity trials, not just as victims who have personal interests in the proceedings, but also as active participants in the indictment and prosecution, including the choice of witnesses and the definition of the crime. Oyerbach's vision is also relevant to current debates about the gender dimensions of international criminal law more generally. Feminist engagement with uh, international criminal law has largely focused on conflict-related sexual violence. Oyerbach adopted a more holistic understanding of genocide that encompassed its economic, cultural, and physical aspects. This allowed her to turn her attention to the hunger in the ghetto on the one hand and to cultural resistance on the other. Both aspects involve the, specif uh, the specificity of women's suffering, but also their agency. Her view of testimony giving and collecting uh, evidence as antidotes to genocide enabled her to depict acts of resistance in which both women and men took part. Oyerbach's vision of the Eichmann trial, even though it did not materialize in full, can offer an important alternative. It allows us to see how an understanding of the crime of genocide that emphasizes its cultural aspects, which were excluded from the Genocide Convention, can be combined with a procedural effort to engage the victims and allow them to become full and equal partners in atrocity trials. This is an important alternative that should be taken into serious consideration. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Leora, uh, for such a profound and moving lecture. And I, I think 
one of the challenges to us, which we will discuss in the panel, is how much we've learned and whether we've moved on from what we described there. And so uh, what we will do now, uh, we'll have three responses. Um, I'll introduce the three panelists now and then invite you to take seats in a moment, but I'll, I'll uh, introduce you first. So the first response will be from Professor Dan Diener, who, as you have heard, is the chair of the Alfred Landecker Foundation. He's Professor Emeritus of Modern History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The second response is from Dr. Nicola Palmer, who is reader in criminal law at the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London. And the third response is by Federica de la Sandra, who is the deputy director of the Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict here at the Blavatnik School of Government. So uh, what I suggest is we all come and sit in these five chairs here, including Leora. And um, I think it will work if we speak from the chairs rather than coming up to the uh, podium. So Dan, if you're ready. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. And um, thank you very, very much, Leora, for your extraordinary and thought-provoking lecture. Um, I learned quite a lot, and my reaction would imply your presentation, and I would like to move it concerning the argument, or to focus on one argument relating to the question of individual witnessing and collective witnessing. That's a big change concerning that kind of a crime, which is not only a mass crime, but has a specific character. And the specific character is that it's a crime without a reason and without a meaning. And in order to add a specific moment, it's an industrialized murder. And in so far, it's the fabrication of deaths at the core of the event of the Holocaust. I would like to put one argument forward relating to a subject matter that I'm interested in, the subject matter of legal anthropology. Witnessing a collective murder, which means everybody and everywhere has to be killed belonging to the collective. The Holocaust transcends because of its exterminating nature. The concepts, the notions and the norms of domestic criminal law. The question is, what is the moment and the place of the witness confronting such a crime? And that's quite problematic. And I will relate later on, five minutes, to the core of the presentation of your. What is the meaning of industrial killing? It is the constant repetition of the same. And in order to find the proper semiotic mode of expressing that form of killing, and that was especially true at the beginning, let's say post-1945, the first historiographical works about 
that what happened at the core of the Holocaust, that the form was the statistics. And less the proper narration based on this specific form of killings, rep the repetition of the same. Now concerning witnessing and recording. And that's what we learned from Leora's presentation. Her perspective, the perspective of Rachel Euerbach was, and that has to be put forward, in distinction or even in juxtaposition to the industrialized murder in the death camps, the perspective of the ghetto. That's a quite different frame of perceiving and understanding. In the ghetto, well, and that's what it seemed to those who currently there, where, well, social life continued. Continued at a specific, obviously, a specific pressure. We learned about it, hunger, and other forms of suppression. But still, it was in a social fabric which indicated something which resembles normalcy. However, it was the forecourt of collective death. What was the epistemic angle of witnessing and telling the victim's story? And what can we learn? What can we understand from that specific constellation? Hardly a victim, or so Leora told us about the person who escaped the death fabric of Treblinka. But by and large, hardly a person escaped the heart of darkness, which means the gas chambers, nobody escaped. Nobody escaped the death of suffocating as a form of collective destruction at the heart of the very event. The view from the, view from the ghetto is a view from the periphery. It's not the heart of the event. And that makes telling, recording, and explaining the story more possible. I'm, I'm finishing. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, sorry for it. I just wanted, well, to finish my very short intervention and argument. The witness, and that's a new form of witnessing concerning mass atrocities, is a witness who is telling the collective story of the very event, composed of that what was seen and recorded. But it's not the heart of the story of the collective crime representing the collective that was doomed to die. Thank you so much. Now.
So, so Nicola. Thank you, Laura, and, and thank you, Dan. Um, <clears throat> Laura, your, your lecture and the paper was so rich, and I really showed the strength of bringing careful historical work on atrocity archives and on the people involved in creating and curating them into the general discussions on international criminal law and, and transitional justice. And so there's, there's so much that can be said. Um, and so I'm going to restrict my comments um, to a brief reflection on resistance, because this was something that came through so strongly to me in the paper. And I'm going to speak to two aspects of this. But the first, I felt re you really brought to, brought to life about how when a victim comes, when one engages in the strictures of the legal process, the victim is still able to subvert, to resist, to extend, or to reshape these formal legal processes. And so here I think we see resistance in participation in the legal process. And then the second point, which I will come to, is resistance for those who choose not to participate in that legal process. But let me stay with the first, because I think in this reclaiming of agency through participation, in reading the paper, I was, I was really struck by this, this restive claiming of legal space through grassroots movements around how to gather and, and archive testimony at the time of the atrocity. And it, it really spoke to some of the contexts in my own work that I'm more familiar with of South Africa, of Rwanda, and, and in northern Uganda. And so what I think you show is that, that, this, that Obach's work, we, in Obach's work, we see a widening in our appreciation, first, of the forms of survivor testimony. So the diary emerges as testimony. Things can be written that can't actually be said. And some of the reason for that not saying is what Dan's touched on, on the industrial murder. But we, also, but we see in this writing as a new form of testimony in this documentation, a form of resistance itself. So in the Warsaw Ghetto, the victims understood the need to document the catastrophe while it was happening. And that's so it's this collecting of testimony and history writing as part of a popular movement, as you say, of the people, for the people, that I really see this act of resistance emerging, testimony as resistance. And I think Olbach's work and her, and her writing on this wider endeavor of how those inside of the ghetto then maintain their Jewish political and cultural life through newspapers, schools, libraries, and cultural events as here we see testimony as resistance, but then we see culture as resistance to genocide in particular. And so gathering testimony through grassroots movements, I think, is something we are increasingly seeing as a way of responding and broadening our responses to large scale violence. So here I am thinking in the South African context, how in the wake of the TRC, We've seen the push for new individual prosecutions coming from the, the Kulumani support group, which is a grassroots survivor-based social movement who have carefully collected and recorded the testimony of the original 130,000 victims of apartheid abuse that were then slowly whittled down through the official processes of the TRC. I think we also see this, the new forms, the way the resistance, the resistance through testimony in the wake of the TRC, where we've seen the Commission of Inquiry in South Africa that was set up following the Marikana massacre, where in August 2012, the South African police service opened fire on striking mine workers, killing 34 of them. And during these proceedings, the victims spontaneously stood up and showed the scars on their bodies as an act of resistance to the government's account of that violence as being in self-defense, 
because the scars were on the back of their were on their backs. And so we see the physical body as this as a testimony and as an act of resistance in the trials. And then I think of, of Leila Ulrich's work at the moment on victim participation um, before the ICC in northern Uganda, where she shows how women reclaim space in the ICC's outreach activities, not through what they say, but through how they bring their children to the outreach meetings, how they um, haggle over transport costs, and in doing so, how they make a, an articulation about the material inequality that's underpinning the violence. And so, so in thinking about this, I really thought that in, in, in recovering Orbach's endeavor, you really bring to the fore the capacity of testimony to change the nature and the restrictions of legal process as an act of resistance and as a way of bringing an account of resistance into a legal process that by its nature is focused on, as you so rightly say, the physical atrocity and the individual responsibility. And so I'll end somewhat with a question. Because it's, it's a question around how, if we recognize this resistance inside of testimony, do we also take account of those who resist through refusing to participate in international trials? or refusing to participate in state-led justice processes or, or um, transitional justice initiatives. And so it's my question here of what can the archive tell us about those who, who didn't participate or, or are pushing back on the form in its entirety, given how strongly you show the resistance within that participation? So much. And hold that question. <laughs> Federica. Thank you, Joe. Um, and uh, thank you, of course, to our uh, brilliant keynote, to Nicole and to Dan, for such an insightful discussion so far. It's truly an honor to be able to participate um, on uh, um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, I've learned so much, and um, I wanted to draw out uh, just a, a couple of um, uh, points that I think are key uh, arising precisely uh, from, your, from your presentation. The first is the, the importance, as you underscore, of inclusivity and um, diversity of voices in international law and international justice. This, of course, is for respect to the voices of women, the voices of minorities, but especially the voices of victims, the uh, affected com communities. Uh, who are really truly the only ones that um, know best what suits their uh, context. Um, so the importance of including uh, victims' voices, not as a matter of fact, not including victim, victims' voices, but bringing them at the fore and at the core of our responses to mass atrocities. And this, this is because, of, although, of course, our conversation today is focusing on trial and international criminal law, um, there is a range of other ways in which justice can manifest itself. We have an entire um, a set of tools in the transitional justice toolkit uh, that can be complementary or alternative even to criminal trials. And in fact, only local communities will know what suits them best. Uh, and I think that this goes to the core of this uh, notion of uh, victim-centered justice, uh, of victims as not just equal protagonists, but the main stakeholders in the justice process. And um, what I want to um, draw everybody's attention to um, is, in a way, uh, how we're seeing some of the elements of the legacy uh, of Auerbach's conception of victim-centered justice playing out in international, um, um, in the accountability space today. Uh, and this is precisely because I submit uh, um, victims agency is reshaping and changing this field in at least three important ways. The first one is um, with respect to the documentation and investigation of atrocity crimes itself. And this is where I think there is some of the most interesting parallelism with the work um, of Auerbach. Um, this notion of grassroots movements, victim-centric, victim-driven justice movements of the people, uh, for the people, as you call them, uh, where we have local civil society actors and now have become so immensely apt at documenting and investigating atrocity crimes 
um, to, including by taking judicial standards into account precisely because they enter into these documentation processes with the idea of accountability proceedings down the line. And they've become so effective that their contributions today are so valuable to judicial uh, processes well beyond um, their role as uh, witnesses. Um, they're helpful in not just identifying but tracking perpetrators. They're immensely helpful through documentary technologies in helping prove uh, patterns of violations, chain of command, um, and other elements that are important to establishing not only the commission of international crimes, but also who did it and against who. And I think that that's where really uh, their contribution is most important, um, telling the story of the crime from the perspective, perspective of the victim. We can make sure that the less visible violations um, are not only properly taken into account, but also that the intersectional identities of victims are uh, accounted for. And this is something that we failed to do historically in the international justice field. Uh, and I'll give you two examples uh, with women uh, being reduced, um, the, the experience of women being reduced to uh, being victims of sexual or gender-based violence, or the experience of children often in war being reduced to uh, uh, their conscript uh, conscription as child soldiers, or in the case of girls, often um, uh, human trafficking. Um, um, similarly to the uh, to Auerbach's work, I see this work as foundational to the ability to uh, bring perpetrators to justice. And in fact, I think we can see a direct path, as you called it, um, uh, between these documentation efforts and a lot of the uh, justice and accountability proceedings we're seeing. Uh, in fact, I think we're seeing a cascade of accountability proceedings, uh, be they before the International Criminal Court, but also before the International Court of Justice, uh, as well as um, in a third country um, uh, pursuing to universal jurisdiction. Um, where we're seeing the evidence that uh, these groups in the civil society, these local victims groups are gathering really uh, playing out in the courtroom. Um, but I think that there is also a third um, layer, uh, which is even where there is no immediate pathway to justice to be found, uh, the advocacy and the, and the um, uh, agency of victims has been instrumental in actually generating a new uh, set of international justice institutions that is not um, um, you know, prosecutorial in the traditional sense because these, um, these institutions cannot indict individuals, cannot uh, carry out proceedings themselves, but what they can do and what they're mandated to do, but the United Nations in particular, we have examples in Syria, Myanmar, uh, Iraq, and elsewhere, is they, with the support of the civil society and in collaboration with the civil society, they gather, preserve, analyze the evidence, and, and build cases uh, to a judicial standard uh, and, and keep the re those, that evidentiary record for when uh, and if accountability processes will be able because jurisdictional pathways will open up. So to conclude, I think that these three examples that I brought, uh, at least in my opinion, paint a little bit of a picture, which is that of a, a gradual shift in the center of gravity in the international justice field to where it really belongs, which is with the victims. And in fact, their agency is really pushing this field into its new frontiers. So thank you for your contribution and for the opportunity to participate. So, uh, Leora, we, we have time for a short response. So, short. Well, um, so if, if you take, so this is going to be very cruel to you, one minute per participant, and then drinks out there, and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your very thoughtful reactions. And I'll uh, go by the order of uh, uh, speaking. So, Dan, first, um, uh, you know, you anticipated my next uh, uh, research, uh, which is uh, on Euerbach, uh, who published this, maybe the second book on Treblinka in the fields of Treblinka. And uh, there she's looking for a new way of uh, witnessing a death camp as opposed to uh, uh, to ghetto and to deal with the question of statistics or narration that you are uh, uh, telling about. And what she's doing is looking for a new kind of witness and she turns to things, clothes, everyday things, and to earth itself as her new inanimate witnesses. But when she does it, she goes back to the statistical documentation by the victims themselves, 
who were part of the Zonderkommando in the death camp and took note of the numbers of how many pens were uh, uh, stolen and so forth. And so she's creating a statistical uh, witnessing, but she cannot do it, uh, do it only with numbers because she understands testimony as also bringing back the humanity to a dehumanizing murder. So the question is also always for her, how do you document the dehumanization, which is statistics, numbers, etc., while keep on bringing back the, the stories, the narration, the humanity of the victim as testifying, testifying. And she finds various solutions to this. One of the solutions is to document the language, the changed language in the death camp. And she's uh, and she's trying to bring back uh, to bring together the testimonies of the perpetrators with the language that has changed uh, that uh, talks about the banality of language and how you describe this kind of atrocities. So I really think it's an interesting combination that she finds, uh, but she constantly pushes uh, the the borders or the boundaries of testimony and and certainly i think she, that she has envisioned forensic archaeology much earlier you know decades earlier than the technology was actually created but this is not part of my uh, talk today but uh, there is a lot there uh, but you're right it's it's you touched on the main uh, um, the main tension here there, one more thing, in 1953, she is writing to an Israeli newspaper, Al Mishmar, and she's taking from the testimony of Kaspitsky, the one who escaped from Treblinka and sub subsequently died. And interestingly enough, she is not describing the death murder, but she is describing the, uh, the mass robbery and how the, uh, you are. Uh, dealing with, you eliminate the difference between human beings and human things, and non-human things like their clothes. And so it's a very interesting testimony that, uh, that undermines the division between robbery and murder that has become part of the criminal law versus uh, uh, civil uh, litigation. But uh, now I think this relates back to uh, uh, Nicola's uh, um, question about testimony as resistance. And you raise the question very uh, truly whether um, it can encompass also the resistance to testimony itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that the various ways that uh, Oyerbach is trying, Oyerbach is still uh, committed to talk, but you were right, she's going beyond talking to, uh, to writing, but also she's very interested in film. So for example, she takes the Nazi film of Warsaw Ghetto, which was a propaganda film taken just before the, the elimination of the ghetto, but was a silent movie. And she's intercepting into it the voices of the victims who are trying to undermine what the what the photo is what the film is showing us and this she has done in a testimony she gave to Raphael Lemkin who was trying to collect testimonies to uh, to bring into the Nuremberg trial and there instead of talking about genocide as mass murder She's talking about the role of the camera in genocide, that it is an important role, uh, even more than murder, by the way it uh, transformed the victims themselves. So I think this is, um, this is not a refuse, refusal uh, to testimony, but it is constantly testing the limits of representation and the limits of uh, uh, testimony. But I think 
But as a woman, it's really interesting, it is really important to understand for her that resistance is not just physical and that words can be resistance, which allow a whole spectrum of uh, uh, participation and thinking of women and the specific forms of, witness, uh, of women's part, uh, participation, both as victims and as um, resistors to the, to the crime. And uh, uh, Federica, the uh, Transitional Justice Toolkit. You are a very uh, uh, right to stress that criminal law is not everything. And that uh, uh, there is in international law this move to put criminal law at the center of it because this is the most serious law that we have, but it has its own price. And I think that victims constantly uh, uh, see the prices for uh, uh, focusing on murder as opposed to robbery, focusing on uh, extreme violence as opposed to everyday uh, uh, violence and the kind of inequality that uh, women suffer more. So I think that, um, that first of all, it's important to go beyond the, uh, the criminal law, uh, such as in uh, the TRC was not criminal law, but, uh, but I also think you are right that victims became a part of grassroots collecting evidence and mostly using cameras and uh, technology as a counter, uh, um, counter uh, form of uh, resistance or returning the gaze back uh, from the victim to the uh, uh, to the perpetrator. So again, I would uh, uh, say this is very different from the hierarchy that we are used to in criminal trials: lawyers versus uh, uh, versus victims, historians versus uh, uh, witnesses. Uh, but also back to Dan's uh, important distinction between the individual and the collective. Law always wants individual witnesses, and it is a quite a difficult uh, um, matter when you deal with collective crimes, which uh, uh, both tries to isolate the victims, but also take off their agency by separating them. So I think that thinking about the price of the form of law the law that, that is not transparent, it comes with its the, the, uh, demands. And these demands can uh, a lot of time blind us or uh, um, change the, the crime itself. When talking about it, this I think is part of the legacy that not only Eurbach, but the whole uh, archive group were trying to create. So but thank you all of you, I hope that I stayed uh, within the time limit. Uh, no, you didn't. No. <laughs> 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 so, uh, before we wind up, I can't resist um, a comment from my own field, which, which is philosophy. One of the most discussed and insightful concepts that have been used in philosophy in recent decades is epistemological injustice. Mm -hmm. And this just feels like a case study of oh. layers and layers and layers of um, epistemological injustice, which is good in two directions. So I, I think it may be helpful to you, but also helpful for us in philosophy to get new examples, rather than mm -hmm. talking about the same old <laughs> examples. So we've got a very interesting bit of mutual exchange here. So before we wind up, I would just like to thank the uh, behind the scenes staff that have made this possible, the events team, uh, audiovisual and communications, who have done a brilliant job between them of bringing us all together and making this possible and making the live stream possible. But most of all, I want to thank the panelists and Leora for a really brilliant occasion, I believe. Thank and you. I'm sure we all share that and we will continue the discussion over certainly drinks, maybe a few snacks, I'm not too sure, <laughs> out the back just now. Thanks so much. Thank you.